The Senate Committee on Natural Resources will now come to order. Will the Secretary please call roll? Senator Flores? Present. Senator Gokachia? Here. Senator Hansen? Senator Pazina? Present. Uh, Senator Scheibel? Here. Please mark Senator Hansen present when he arrives. There are four present, so we do have a quorum. Before I begin, we would like to provide some general housekeeping reminders. Um, as you come up to the mic, please do say and spell your name for the record. Please do sign in at the table by the door and give the committee secretary your business card if you have one prior to testifying. If you have a handout for the committees, you're asked to provide 10 hard copies to the committee secretary for use by the public. And we will be taking public comment at the end. We'll be providing limited public comment to two minutes per person to ensure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak. And that will also be the same for testimony here today. Please provide any additional comments in writing to the committee secretary and we will be certain that they are added to the record. And we can now mark our colleague and friend, Senator Hansen present. All right, today we'll be hearing two bills, SB 48 and SB 113, and we'll be receiving a presentation from the Desert Research Institute. But our very first order of business is a BDR that requires committee introduction. BDR R349 is sponsored by the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources, and it urges the United States Bureau of Reclamation to consider certain actions, alternatives, and measures for the protection and, and management of the Colorado River. I'd like to remind members that a vote to introduce a BDR requires a majority of the committee, three votes in favor, and a vote in favor of introduction does not indicate your support of the BDR. It only allows the BDR to become a bill or resolution and be referred to a committee for possible hearings. So with that said, I'd like to entertain a motion to introduce BDR R-349. So moved. Second. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We have Sen Senator Scheibel with the motion, and was it Senator Gokachir Flo Flores? Thank you so much for the second. Any discussion? All right. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much. Next, we'll move on to our bill hearings, and we will start with Bill SB 48. I will now open the hearing on Senate Bill 48. This measure revises provisions relating to air quality. When the bill presenter is ready, please go ahead and hit the microphone, share your name and organization with us, and proceed. Thank you. Hello, Chair Pazina and members of the committee. My name is Ashley Garza-Kennedy here on behalf of Clark County, here to present um, Senate Bill 48, uh, spelled G-A-R-Z-A-K-E-N-N-E-D-Y. Uh, SB 48 will change how air quality fines are utilized in Clark County. Before I walk through the sections of the bill, I want to take a step back to provide some background information as to how air quality is handled in this state. Air quality standards, permitting, and enforcement are handled regionally. Washoe and Clark County operate air quality divisions. Um, Excuse me, Washoe and Clark County operate air quality divisions that monitor, permit, and enforce all federal requirements of the Clean Air Act. The State Division of Environmental Protection monitors the air quality for the remaining portions of the state. These three entities can issue fines and penalties related to noncompliance with air quality standards and regulations. Currently, Clark County is required to disperse all fines related to air quality, except for a small portion for administrative costs to the Clark County School District for programs and projects related to air quality. SB 48 will instead allow Clark County the option to delegate the penalties to a broader range of air quality programs and initiatives across the county. With that, I'll walk through the sections of the bill. Section 1, subsection 3 retains but clarifies that Clark County is only to use $17,500 per year for administrative costs. Additionally, this section provides Clark County greater flexibility to use this account to support air quality activities, services, and programs in the community that al align with our state implementation plan, or SIP, that is required by the Environmental Protection Agency. Just to take a moment of clarity to clarify what SIP is, it's simply a set of regulations each, each state or region um, developed to monitor, maintain, and improve clean air in compliance with federal law. 
A SIP is approved by the federal government and updated when new standards are developed or advanced at the federal level. The remaining changes to this, uh, to this section and section two are clarifying and conforming changes. I will also note that this bill does not have an effective date, thus if um, passed, will be effective October 1, 2023. The intention, of, uh, the intention is that any money the school district has will remain and this policy will be a change for fines collected moving forward. So why are we bringing this bill forward? The answer is twofold. First, Clark County's air quality is in moderate non-attainment. To provide some background on what this means, the EPA uses national air quality standards to rec regulate six common pollutants. Based on these standards, the EPA establishes attainment and non-attainment zones across the United States. An area meets or exceeds national standards is considered in attainment, whereas non-attainment means the area is not meeting the national standards. In 2016, the Las Vegas Valley was a was des designated as marginal non-attainment because of our ground level ozone. Ozone at the ground level is a harmful air pollutant and the main ingredient in smog. In August 2021, when reevaluated by the EPA, we did not reach attainment. And since January of this year, um, the Las Vegas Valley has been classified as moderate non-attainment. To put this into context, when a region reaches non-attainment, the level of severity can be <coughs> Uh, categorized into six classifications, with six being the most severe and one being the least. Today, we are at, uh, in 2016, we reached level one, and today we are at level two. Besides the environmental impacts, not improving air quality could impact our federal highway funding. Secondly, we brought this bill forward because we see a community need and a revenue stream that has been underutilized. Again, the dollars we are discussing are generated from fines and penalties for violating our air quality standards. The Clark County School District is required to submit a plan each year to the Board of County Commissioners indicating how they plan to spend the money they receive for the purposes of air quality. From fiscal year 09 to 2003, on average, the school district received just over $500,000. However, in the same time frame, the school district on average has spent has spends just over 330,000 which has contributed to a growing ending fund balance given the immediate air quality needs in Clark County we do not have the luxury of not spending every dollar that concludes my remarks and I'm happy to take questions are there any questions from the committee senator Scheibel thank you um, what programs would the money be used towards if it were in county control. Thank you for the question. Ashley Garza Kennedy through you, Chair, to Senator Scheibel. You can go direct, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So uh, as many of you might have known, Clark County has been over the last couple of years working on our all in Clark County, which is our um, climate action plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 100% by 2050. I think for, for Clark County, one of the biggest and immediate needs that we see um, is something that we're actually doing called our smog-free Clark County. As many of you might remember from last session, um, AB 349 was passed, which closed the classic car, uh, classic vehicle loophole um, that went into effect this year, meaning that anybody who was exempt from a smog check no longer will be unless they have a, a designated classic vehicle. So Clark County has, um, invested $1.4 million into our smog-free Clark County program, which will help low-income residents get their cars up to standards as far as being able to pass a smog test. Um, with this investment, we anticipate we can help between 14 to 1,500 cars. However, in Clark County, we have about 24,000 cars that are registered as a classic vehicle, 16,000 of which are um, likely gonna need to, to be repaired. So while we're excited for this initial investment, it is still an on, uh, a big ongoing issue to make sure that people can, uh, the amount of cars that will need to be up to standards. And I, just to even put this in a little perspective, um, if we repaired 1,500 cars, we could reduce over 175,000 pounds of emissions. Senator Flores. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, and, I, and I don't know if you have the answer, and it, it's completely okay if not. Um, 
But do you know what the original genesis and the original intent was when we wanted to ensure that the money was going to the school district and what, what the conversations were like then when that first went into place um, and why they specifically said that's where we want to make sure it's going. I, I just want to get a little bit of the context of how we landed with, with where the NRS is now before we even get to what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Ashley Garza Kennedy for the record. Um, Senator Flores, thank you for the question. And I, I don't think I have a great answer for you other than um, that th this has existed, I believe, in statute since 07 with the money going to Clark, the Clark County School District. Um, as far as the genesis of, genesis of where that came from in 07, I, I can't speak to that. Follow up, Madam Chair. Thank you. And no worries. Uh, um, and I'm sure we could do some legislative history there and find out a little bit more about that conversation. No issue. Um, I, I guess that the next question is, can you talk about other programs that you have in the county now wherein you are you have a fee or a penalty structure that then feeds back into money that goes to the, to the, the county? Because I know at times we've engaged in those conversations uh, in the legislature, and we want to be careful at times, right, because we, we don't want to have this incentive to c go out and over-penalize it. Um, and, and I think that that might be a conversation we can engage with a little bit. Uh, and, and also, if you could just educate us on how that penalty structure works now. In other words, how do you identify who's breaking the rules? Uh, how's the penalty structure work now? How is there due process in that? Because I think that would give members probably some comfort in knowing that you're not going to have some overzealous uh, officer out there just trying to penalize everybody so you can bring more money to the county. Thank you, Ashley Garza Kennedy, for the record. As far as uh, other Clark County programs that we have related to, to fee structures and, and that kind of going back, I can find that answer for you and give you a couple examples. Um, I will say as far as the incentive, your comment about incentivizing penalties, I will say whenever anyone has violated the conditions of the Clean Air Act, it goes to an independent review. It's not handled by us. And then after that step, they can still, uh, um, uh, the person who is, uh, that we're speaking about who is, um, has the penalty, they can also uh, request for an additional review by an, another th third party. And then there's also the p possibility for a judicial review. So in very much respect, we are, from the penalty process, we are removed from that. If I could do one more, Madam Chair. And I appreciate that. I promise that that was really a softball, just because I, I know that will probably give everybody comfort in realizing that we're not going to have that happen and just make it clear for the public. Um, maybe a little bit more of a tougher question in, um, and with the caveat that I, we want to be respectful. Uh, I think it's important that we also understand what we think should be happening and isn't and where the frustration with that is. Um, outside of what you're attempting to accomplish with using the money you've indicated, uh, I understand uh, Senator Watts worked on that bill and his objective, and I understand you, you want to alleviate that and potentially use these funds for that. But, you know, what, what are the biggest concerns, what are the conversations like now with the school district that said, you know, that really put you in a position to say, we, we have to take an initiative and try to act because we don't believe that the original intent of this bill back in 2007, when that language was put in, is really been being fulfilled. Thank you for the question, Ashley Garza Kennedy. I, I think that f uh, for, for Clark County and our Board of County Commissioners felt very strongly, they approve these plans that are coming forward by the school district every year of how they intend to spend the money. Um, and I think the, the sticking point was to see such um, that just this year alone, we our air quality has has gotten worse in the Las Vegas Valley, and to see um, this money that is for the purposes of air quality, improving air quality, supporting air quality programs and initiatives, and not being spent by the school district, 
in, in a way that has made the end, growing ending fund balance continue to grow. And I, that, that is why we're, this bill came forward. And I, I will say that I, I recognize that the school district is in opposition to this bill. And in, we did try to work with the school district and offered a conceptual amendment that would have allowed us to split, split the, the revenue from these penalties, capping the amount of allocation that they can receive at $450,000 and that they wouldn't be able to carry over their end fund balance. Uh, that amendment was not accepted. Thank you again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, my question would be, and then if there's any other questions from members, let me just quickly. Has the fund balance that's come in from the air emissions violations been the exact same amount every single year since 2009? So it's never varied. It's always been the exact same amount every single year. Thank you, Chair. Ashley Garza Kennedy, for the record, no. And that is one of the other, I think, struggles that the school district probably, and I can't speak for them, but may have had is that it is very hard to plan programming around a set of revenue that is volatile. And it is. It's based off of penalties. It is based off of people violating the Clean Air Act. And so it changes year to year. Um, as an example, from in fiscal year 2023, there was over uh, $1.1 million that was received from these penalties. But the year before, that it was a little over 900,000 and the year before the year before that 500 so it, it really does vary thank you so much I and I think what I was getting at is it, it can be hard sometimes to plan budgeting ahead when you're not exactly sure how much is coming in so thank you very much Senator Hansen thanks madam chair okay the school district plans on using that for bus conversions um, if we took the money uh, and gave it to you, is there some supplemental fund or something the school district could use to build their bus fleet? Yes. So uh, to put this in perspective, to one bus conversion, so converting one bus from diesel to electric, for example, costs about $500,000. It's, it's expensive. Um, and this particular rev revenue stream is not enough to cover CCSD being able to cover their entire uh, fleet conversion. However, uh, there is a lot of um, federal money out there, in particular um, the uh, Federal Bipartisan Infrastructure Act that was passed. There's about $10 billion that is going to be invested into public transit, and that also includes school buses. $5 billion of, of that is particularly for um, school bus conversion and Clark County um, School District has been awarded nearly almost $10 million to do fleet conversion, which will help them do 25 school buses um, in, the, in the infrastructure to support it. And there's also other federal grants um, available from the, uh, the Diesel Emission Reduction Act, um, and then also there's some state money as well. Follow up. Uh, out of the 16,000 uh, vehicles you think will need help Do you guys have an idea I mean what's the estimated cost per vehicle I, I got it for example I got a 1975 Toyota Land Cruiser right yeah. got an old, it's got a Chevy 350 in it. <laughs> but a uh, uh, very old standard sort of exhaust system I have no idea what it would cost to convert that thing Do you have any idea what the average would be thank you for the question Ashley Garza Kennedy so the the repair costs can vary. It really just depends on how old the vehicle is and when was the last time they did an emissions test uh, or a smog test. Um, when we planned out our Clark County program, Smog Free Clark County, um, we were averaging about nine, $950 to $975 per repair. Okay, and you know, out of the 16,000, you got any, I mean, this is supposed to be for low income people that can't afford to get their vehicles fixed. Out of the 16,000, do you have any rough idea what percentage? Uh, I mean, it's not all 16,000, obviously. Is it half? Is it, you know, 2,500? What? Thank you. For uh, Ashley Garza Kennedy, for the record, so when we looked at um, the, the 25,000 25, uh, vehicles that need to be repaired, I'm sorry, go back, 24,000 vehicles in Clark County are registered as a classic vehicle. That is per what we, data that we have from DMV. 
the 16,000 cars that we anticipate need to be repaired are what we would consider some a car that is not a classic vehicle, like your 1950s hot rod. We're talking about your 1980s and above vehicle that does not meet the definition. So it, it would be 16,000. Oh, wow, you're anticipating that. Okay, I'm thinking 16,000 times 900 bucks, you know, just doing the math on it. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Scheibel. Sorry, I forgot to ask another question earlier because I thought I knew, but now I'm unsure. Um, these penalties are being paid by, can you give us some, you don't have to name names, but can you kind of, kind of give us a sense of whether these are small businesses, large businesses, individuals, who's paying the penalties? Thank you for the question, Ashley Garza Kennedy. I can report back to the committee with a, with a, with a list or I can um, touch base with our environmental and uh, environmental uh, air quality department at Clark County. Um, but in general, right, we're talking about uh, whenever anybody's issued fines related to air quality, it, it has to be significant. So we're, we're talking about usually major players. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, thank you so much. Next, we'll hear testimony in support of Senate Bill 48. As a reminder, testimony in support, opposition, or neutral is limited to two minutes per person, but please feel free to submit additional comments and writing to the secretary that will be added to the record. So anyone in support, please come on up. All right, seeing no one in Carson City, is there anyone in Las Vegas? It looks pretty empty, but you never know. All right, BPS, anyone over the phones testifying in support? If you'd like to testify in support of SB 48, please press star nine now on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers wishing to testify in support at this time. Thank you so much. Next, we will hear testimony in opposition to SB 48. Is there anyone in Carson City who'd like to testify in opposition? If so, please come on up. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Patricia Haddad, Director of Government Relations for the Clark County School District. Um, just to, to share our opposition um, it, to the bill as, as currently written, um, Clark County School District has a long-standing partnership with Clark County on the use of these funds. Um, and throughout this partnership, CCSD has demonstrated responsible and impactful use of the funds to support student academics, enrichment programs related to air quality and the environment, as well as mitigation efforts through infrastructure improvements that directly improve the built environment around students, families, and the educators that are in the school buildings each day. Um, based on these efforts and the positive impact on our, our children and the quality of their futures, um, we do feel that CCSD is uniquely positioned to continue to deploy these funds in a way that addresses both short and long-term needs for improving the quality of the air that we're all breathing there in Southern Nevada. Um, and, and just to briefly talk a little bit about the, the use of the funds um, going towards curriculum, going towards those enrichment activities, as well as, like I said, infrastructure improvements, bus fleet conversions, HVAC improvements of portable um, uh, portable classrooms, um, all, all, like we said, trying to, to get at this, this larger um, goal of ensuring that we're uh, being efficient in, in energy use as well as efficient in, in um, ensuring that we are uh, uh, a contributing member in improving um, air quality in, in Southern Nevada. And so grateful for your time and, and, and happy to follow up with any information that the committee may need. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman uh, Fuzina and members of the committee, Peter Kruger with the Nevada Petroleum Marketers Convenience Store Association. It's our members who majority are fine for things, such things as not having a working boot on your nozzle, not having the correct paperwork. And it's not the amount in this bill that concerns us, it's the principle uh, I think that uh, Senator Flores raised about, I would describe it as the uh, fox guarding the hen house in the sense that there, when the agency imposing the fines gets direct uh, monetary um, benefit from those fines, as, as hard as a human being may try, 
we look at a budget every year like all of us do and we've got a shortfall how well let's see is it is it the same as uh, law enforcement needing to write more tickets to uh, balance the budget so it's the principle of this issue that that concerns us not the idea that uh, that uh, the Clark County uh, air quality needs more money um, we understand that and and there are other ways we believe uh, in which to uh, accomplish those goals for example uh, we uh, the testimony was provided that simply um, we're going to help uh, cash for clunkers that was the old term uh, and buy back a lot of these cars that are going to be repaired are people who took advantage of the law passed many years ago that simply said look um, if you don't if you're a if you're a, a classic car we'll just take off the catalytic converter we'll make all sorts of changes and now those same people have to all of a sudden spend all sorts of money so again it's the principle uh, in this not the the amount of money thank you thank you so much is there anyone else who'd like to testify in opposition in Carson City All right, not seeing anyone in Vegas. BPS, is there anyone over the phone who'd like to testify in opposition? If you'd like to testify in opposition of SB 48, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you so much. Is there anyone here in Carson City who'd like to testify in neutral? Seeing no one in Vegas, BPS, is there anyone who would like to testify neutral over the phone? If you would like to testify neutral on SB 48, please press star nine now. Chair, you have no callers wishing to testify neutral at this time. Thank you so much. Would the bill presenter please like to provide any closing remarks? Thank you, Ashley Garza Kennedy, Clark County. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present this bill. And I just want to reiterate um, f from the opposition regarding from the petroleum uh, petroleum groups regarding the incentivize the incentive to over penalize. I want to say that whenever anybody is facing a violation, those violations first go to an independent hearing officer. Those that at that point it could be appealed um, to a independent hearing board, and then the third step is that it could go also to a judicial review. So I, I just want to reiterate the fact that um, there that there is um, that there is faith in this process. Um, and then I, I also just wanted to reiterate that whenever we are in non-attainment on any level of severity from the federal, from the EPA, it's not great. And we risk um, having to go through other sanctions by the federal government. We risk our highway funding. Uh, so when we're talking about air quality, it's, it's really important that we improve it. Um, and, and we don't have the luxury of, of waiting. And that, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll now close the hearing on Senate Bill 48. And I will now open the hearing on Senate Bill 113 by one of our own on the committee. This measure revises provisions relating to groundwater management plans. And I believe that the bill presenter, Senator Goa is going to be presenting on this. And please proceed when you are ready. Madam Chair and Committee, uh, good afternoon. I was hoping there were a few more people here about air quality, but I see I missed my guess. Uh, again, Senator Pete Goikachia, representing Senate District 19, and uh, bringing you Senate Bill 113 today. Uh, I have with me Doug Busselman. This is a request bill from the Nevada Farm Bureau. Doug is the executive director of Nevada Farm Bureau. Also in the uh, audience, uh, we have Jake Tippetts. He has no position on the bill, but he is the person that drafted the groundwater management plan for Diamond Valley and really has the expertise if you have some questions along those lines. 
Uh, first of all, uh, Senate Bill 113 is in response to a piece of legislation we passed 10, 11 years ago, trying to put another tool in the toolbox for those basins that are over-appropriated and over-pumped in this state, and we've got a number of them. Over half our basins are over-appropriated. Uh, we don't know exactly how many are over-pumped, but it is an issue we're going to have to drill with, deal with, and uh, this is what this piece of legislation is about. First of all, I want to state that this does not impact any basin other than one that is designated as a critical management area. Now, I know there's been a flurry of emails going around, and also it does not impact domestic wells in any way, shape, or form. They're already covered under statute. Unless you are in a critical management area, and even statute covers that, you, are, you have a guaranteed half-acre foot. That's in statute already. doesn't have anything to do with that Senate Bill 113, and so maybe some of those will go away. Uh, you know, there's nothing like a couple of court cases to point out the, fall, the holes in a piece of legislation you passed. And that's exactly with what we're dealing with here with Senate Bill 113. We're trying to clarify in statute, again, what we put in place in the 2011 session, and that is that it does not take away from priority water law, first and foremost. And uh, it did not intend for a groundwater management plan to go beyond 10 years. If you look at the original statute, we said, okay, you can come together, you have a 10-year period to see through conservation or reductions uh, that how you can, in fact, accomplish a reduction in your groundwater use. And hopefully, and that's what the law requires, you start seeing some reco recovery. Uh, Senate Bill 113, as drafted is really where we're headed and I'll let Doug kind of walk through the bill. I know there are a number of amendments out there and uh, I don't think we're going to get a ton of <laughs> ton of testimony in support or even in opposition but uh, with these amendments most of it is we agree on the concept. It's just a little wordsmithing. Are we talking perennial static levels? Uh, one of the big issues in 113 that Doug I'm sure will speak to uh, is the fact that you want to make sure you don't get the tail wagging the dog, and that's where, if you end up in a basin where everyone ends, or the majority ends up under the cut line, the print of the yield line, then in fact they could change the groundwater management plan for the basin if there were more juniors than there was seniors. If you get so over appropriated, you get to that point, you're really in trouble. I'm not saying that's where Diamond Valley is, but it's probably close to it, and uh, that's why. Again, that's why this legislation has come forward. So with that, again, really doesn't, Im doesn't impact <laughs> domestics. It doesn't impact you if you're not in a critical management area. So maybe that'll make some people in the room a little more comfortable. And uh, really, it's just about maintaining priority water law in the state, which is critical, and uh, also cleaning up the toolbox here a little bit to where we can say, bottom line is, this group of people can come together and through conservation and or some other efforts, and I know we're not supposed to talk about another bill, but there is another bill out there that talks about retiring water rights, and I think these two bills will end up somewhat married. We've got to talk about that. We're over-appropriated. What do we do with that over-appropriation? And I feel strongly that in the end, we're going to have to look at retiring some water rights. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. Mr. Bussman, would you like to walk through the bill first, or should we start asking questions? I can walk through the bill and go from there. Sounds good. Thank you. For the record, I'm Doug Busselman, B-U-S-S-E-L-M-A-N. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Nevada Farm Bureau, and at the onset, I'd like to thank Senator Gokachia for his help in bringing this bill before you today. Senate Bill 113 is a very simple and straightforward proposal. It has the purpose of protecting property rights of senior water right owners in areas that have been designated as critical management areas and locally developed groundwater management plans are prepared and submitted to the state engineer for consideration. Section 1, subsection 2 of the bill, page 2, lines 12 through 17, state that a groundwater management plan prepared and submitted to the state engineer for consideration must be signed by a majority of the senior water right owners in a basin. 
the majority is in the context of the amount of water that a senior water rights account for in the overall amount of water that has been appropriated within the basin. Section 1, subsection 6 of the bill, which is on page 3, lines 23 to 33, covers the protection of senior water right owners. This is based on a senior water right owner not having to have their water included in a groundwater management plan. Section 1, subsection 7 of the bill, page 3, lines 34 through 42, identifies that after a 10 consecutive years of operating a groundwater management plan, the state engineer is required to check and see whether there has been progress in stabilizing the, drowned, the groundwater of the, of the basin. If the plan didn't work in making progress, the groundwater, is or the groundwater plan is dissolved, and that's covered in sub A on line 43, and the curtailment process is launched, which is covered in sub B on line one uh, through three on page four. Well, we believe that local water right owners should be given the opportunity to work together in seeking strategic well management plans to work toward aquifer uh, stabilization and recovery, we still maintain that the doctrine of prior appropriations cannot be imperiled. Property rights matter and senior water right owners should not have their water taken away from them without their willingness to be part of a groundwater management plan. Uh, I'm going to go off my, my comments now to make a comment on, I know that there have been um, some amendments that have been submitted uh, for consideration by the committee. Uh, the one that is in the record or in the Nellis that I looked at this morning covered uh, that came from the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Um, in our mind, and I've talked with them about this, in our mind, their proposed amendment takes away everything that we're trying to accomplish in this bill by the deletions that they're proposing. And so we are not in favor of that particular proposal. Uh, we are interested and willing to talk with others, and if there's a need for further conversations, um, we're willing to participate in those conversations. But again, our primary focus is attempting to protect senior water right owners in critical management areas that have groundwater plans that are submitted. So for that, um, that covers my presentation, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. I have a couple of questions, and I know that Senator Hansen and maybe some other committee members do as well. Um, so you mentioned the legislation, I think it was 10, 11 years ago. Has a groundwater plan been put in place since that last legislation was in place? Uh, Senator Kachia, for the record, yes, the Diamond Valley groundwater plan has been put in place. And as I said, the drafter of that plan is in the audience and willing to testify. Thank you. As a follow-up, has the state engineer had a chance to look at that in regards to the appropriations and see if that plan has succeeded? Uh, Senator Goykichia, for the, for the record, yes, the plan was adopted by former state engineer Jason King, and that's kind of part of the problem. Even though Jason and I worked on the, the legislation, the plan extends out 35 years, and uh, that's kind of problematic. I think if you've got an issue, the statute said... 10 years to deal with it, and the groundwater plan extended beyond out, out 35 years, and ultimately we ended up in court, and uh, the Supreme Court ruled on this. That's why we're back here clarifying the language. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I think that's really what, uh, what subsection 7 is aimed for. It, it basically takes it from this point when the bill is passed. That will become the 10-year clock starting off for a state engineer to, to review uh, a plan and right now there's only one plan in place so from from this point forward if if the bill passes uh, in 10 years the state engineer will be responsible for reviewing to determine whether that groundwater plan has been successful or not perfect I didn't realize that the first bill gave 35 years that's quite a few decades. Um, last question for me and then I know the committee has questions what percentage of senior water right holders 
would you say are in these critical management areas? 10%, 50%, 60%? I'm just curious. Uh, Senator Goykachia, for the record, I need some clarification. Are you talking statewide or? In the critical management area specifically There's only, where you're. Okay, the one is Diamond Valley, and, and I think I need to go back and correct a record too. Now, the original statute didn't say 35 years. It said 10 years. He had 10 years to submit a groundwater plan, or the basin does. They submitted the plan in the required 10 years, but, uh, four or five years into it, but that plan is what pushed it out to 35 years. The statute called for 10 in the original statute as well. Uh, in, in Diamond Valley, again, I would prefer the real expert on that is Mr. Tippett's. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Senator Hansen. Jake, you're going to be on the hot seat. I see you smiling over there. Uh, a couple of things. One, the Supreme Court decision was like a 4-3 decision. Uh, but the question of senior water right holders, which uh, the chair just brought up, technically there's only one senior water right holder because everybody that has below him would be considered junior, wouldn't they? Is there actually a definition of a senior water right holder? I'm just kind of curious. In the language that's proposed, there is a definition that basically covers uh, that the senior water right owners are those, um, again, Doug Busselman, for the record, uh, the, 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 de the definition is based on the people who owned water rights before, they, before the basin went over the, the limit. Of, I see, of, okay. Of, of, uh, so, there, so there is a definition. I'm just kind of curious, like, how do you that's determine how we've defined who's senior? There. That right. makes sense. Uh, uh, next question. Now, the Saddler Ranch folks sent a, a letter in, and they mentioned that traditionally the Saddler Ranch had, was spring-fed, and that since the basin had been pumped uh, extensively, the springs have dried up. When the state engineer or whoever gets to determine what is the acceptable levels, um, I mean, would you determine it to where the springs start to flow again on the Saddler Ranch? Or is it just a st stability that the, the water table doesn't go below, you know, 100 feet or whatever? I'm kind of curious, maybe not a question for you guys with the state engineer, but who determines what the correct level, uh, when the smoke wall clears on this thing, uh, what is the correct level, you know? Is it back to traditional spring-fed Saddler Ranch, or is it keeping it so it doesn't drop below 100 feet, you know, down in the wells? Senator Goykachia, for the record, again, I think to clear case in point in this is, and I'm very familiar with the Sadler and Diamond Valley, but uh, uh, that you have recovery. And, and again, that to be determined, recovery in Diamond Valley to not so much the Sadler, uh, you know, even though it's been impacted, there are other sources in Diamond Valley that are completely dry. And uh, so, uh, you know, you could be a century getting those back. But again, it's about recovery. We overappropriated it. We overpumped it. Now we've got to correct it. And how we get there, conservation, maybe, maybe you can get there, but again, I'm, I'm thinking at some point we have to look at retiring water rights. If, again, Doug Busselman, for the record, if I could jump in, on page three, um, in around uh, lines um, 37 and 38, it, it speaks there to the fact that, that the analysis will be done to determine um, whether there's been um, significant progress toward um, stabilizing the drawdown. So I guess probably under this language, the, the definition would be that that when you when you are at a point where you're not getting worse, that would be considered uh, to be the the, the, the the point. That makes sense. Well, I'll probably the state engineer or somebody from their office, I'm sure, is going to come up. So I'm kind of just curious about the direction that's going. I guess we, we ought to make sure that everybody understands, too, there's only one critical management area in the entire state. So when this bill talks about that, we're really exclusively talking about Diamond Valley in Eureka County, correct? We, we're only talking about the one that has happened so far, but it, this bill is not intended to be... Um, to go back. Oh, I see. It, we're, 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 we're looking ahead, and it's, it's based on whatever um, critical management areas may come in the future. We're not, we're not retrying Diamond Valley. The only, the only part of this bill that covers Diamond Valley is Section 7, where if the bill passes, there will be a review as to whether or not there's been progress after 10 years. Right, but, not waiting for 35 years. Well, that was the chair's, chair's point. I mean, but in, look, but in that's, terms, unreal, that's unrealistic to, you know, third of a century out before you can't go back and say, hey, we got a problem here. But in terms of, of the other provisions, this bill does not cover those. 
we're only talking about the future and any future plans that come along uh, and, and any critical management areas that may occur in the future. Very good, thank and, you. And if I may, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Goykachia for the record. Again, given the number of over-appropriated basins in this state, this will not be the only critical management area. At some point, the state engineer will declare a basin a critical management area, and they may choose at that point not to put a groundwater plan in. But in 10 years, then the option is you curtail by priority, and you adjust it until the basin starts to recover. It's harsh, but it's water. Thank you. Senator Scheibel. Thank you. So I want to make sure that I'm understanding section one correctly uh, regarding the petition with the uh, groundwater management plan. And um, maybe starting off with, my understanding is that there are more senior uh, water rights holders in the state than junior holders. Is that accurate? I don't have the exact numbers, but I think the assumption is that that's true. Because, okay. Because in, in under the definition that we're working with, junior water right owners have more or less come into a basin after, that, that they're the ones that cause the over-appropriation. Okay, thank you. So I, I just wanted to make, oh, go ahead. Just a clarification on that, and, and I'm sure Mr. Tippett's would be far more articulate in doing this, but as you're as the basin drops, the perennial yield drops, and the water that's available then puts more people in, more permits get above the cut line, and that makes them junior. So as the basin gets worse, then the junior, the number of junior permit holders increases. Okay, and, and, and so I wanna make sure that I'm understanding um, subsection A, subsections one and two are basically saying that within this one area, let's say we have 100 water rights holders and 75 of them have senior rights and 25 have junior rights. You're saying the petition has to be signed by 51 people or 51 rights holders and 38 of those, so a majority of the 75, have to be senior water rights holders. And the purpose of that, I'm going to I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I want to guess it's so that the junior water rights holders can't all band together, pick off a few of the senior right, water rights holders, and then pass a plan that is not approved by the majority of the senior rights holders. You have it exactly what we're intending. Okay. What's your name? Uh, Doug Busselman, <laughs> for the record. And then uh, one other question um, on Section 7 and the significant progress. Do we have a definition of significant progress? Senator Gorkachia, for the record, again, that's where the word smithing, smithing comes in. That's been a lot of the dialogue. Again, do we talk about perennial yield? How do you stand, establish that drawdown? Are we talking static levels? You know, it, it depends on, you know, who you're talking to, whether you're talking to a farmer or a hydrologist. They want a different terminology. But the bottom line is I think we all know we need to land on it is that water table taken at a specific time of the year that corresponds or relates the, the water table in that basin, and so, we just need to recover it. So maybe the better question is, are you open to an amendment that clarifies what we mean by significant progress? The wordsmithing has been going on and on. I had people in my office at 7.30 this morning, okay. wordsmithing. <laughs> and I don't have the answer. Don't, don't get me wrong. I don't have it either. Um, an um, and... Then I also wanted to just address one issue raised in Sadler Ranch's um, uh, proposed amendment, which is the idea of a hearing regarding whether or not substantial progress has been made towards, um, you know, stabilizing the water levels. And I'm wondering if that's something that you're open to or um, if there's a good reason that we should not be considering that. Again, this is Senator Goykachia for the record, and uh, for the most part, I, I like Sadler Ranch's amendment, but again, that hearing process, I think that just opens it back up, which we're trying to avoid, is to litigation. The state engineer holds a hearing, and what happens? He gets sued because he didn't decide the right way. That's not what the concept of a groundwater management plan is about. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to you both. 
At this point, um, we'll hear testimony in support of Senate Bill 113. As a reminder, testimony in support, opposition, or neutral is limited to two minutes per person. F please feel free, however, to submit additional comments and writing to the secretary to be added to the record. For those of you in Carson City, please come forward. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Kyle Rohrink, Executive Director of the Great Basin Water Network, that is K-Y-L-E-R-O-E-R-I-N-K. -E -E uh, we support this bill and especially uh, that subsection 7, I think, is what gives us the guarantee where, you know, you, you got to start curtailing at some point if, if you want to get things back in balance. And I think with the original uh, intent that uh, Senator Goykachia talked about, you know, it, it just makes sense I agree there needs to be some wordsmithing done um, and you know as it relates to just respecting and understanding priority that's the law that that's where we are it's kind of like Southwest uh, Airlines made you a promise if you're uh, you know a one you're gonna have you know the strongest rights you're not gonna be thrown off you know if they overbooked but then you know all of a sudden they overbook and, uh, and now they're looking at throwing, you know, A1 or A2 off. And so that's what we're grappling with. You know, think of it in terms that you all understand, Southwest Airlines. So, you know, anyways, you know, I just think that's, you know, give us some time, let the wordsmithing work out, and, um, but, you know, we'll take it from there. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name's Davey Sticks, it's S-T-I-X. And I'm a member of the Nevada Cattlemen's Association, uh, a rancher and an owner of groundwater rights. And I'm here today to support the Farm Bureau's bill as presented. As many of you have heard from me in the last couple of weeks, um, our industry is a generational industry with many four, five, and six generation families that are operating these ranches. And it's really important that the doctrine of first and right is protected. The two G's are so important when you're in ranching in Nevada, and that's grazing and groundwater. And both of those have to run together. Without one, we cannot uh, graze. So we support the bill wholeheartedly. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Patrick Donnelly with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, we support this bill, and I think at first it looks like a bunch of farmers fighting with each other, and why would an environmental group care? But um, uh, the, the, my first day at the legislature six years ago, I went into Senator Gokachia's office, and he told me, if you protect senior water rights, you protect the environment because those are the oldest water rights. They're generally associated with surface water. You know, we've talked about Sadler Ranch several times today. That ranch has important springs for wildlife and for ecosystems, and uh, those springs are threatened by overappropriation and by groundwater management plans that don't adequately protect senior water rights. So this is also an environmental issue, in addition to being an issue about property rights. And I think we, uh, that's why we're in support of this bill. I also think Section 7, which was previously highlighted, is extremely important. These GMPs should not go on forever. In fact, they're meant as an emergency stabilization. So we need to be looking at a shorter time frame. Is this emergency stabilization working? And if not, take other measures. So that's another important section of the bill. Thank you. Thank you for your time. My name is Levi Shoda. I'm the manager of Sadler Ranch, and I'm speaking on behalf of all of us at Sadler that we uh, strongly support this bill and for all the reasons that have been touched on here. Um, senior water rights uh, need to be protected for, for many reasons, and when this legislation was first passed, uh, it was very vague as far as uh, interpretation in the courts. And so being an entity that we went through the first CMA and through the first GMP and uh, through the litigation process of it, we found that with the vagueness of that original legislation, that opened up interpretation to the courts that I don't believe that the initial legislators meant for this plan. Because again, we're trying to stabilize these basins that are over-appropriated. Um, so firsthand, that's, that's one point that, that I want to uh, really give a lot of support for. The other is... Um, and Senator Scheibel, you brought this up, was, you know, what is stabilization? And that is something that the more teeth we could sink into this um, to not allow this to continue on, I think the stronger, so the better the language in that, the stronger this would be. Uh, because if not, then this does become an, uh, 
environmental issue. We do have these springs. They're, they're hot springs, and we support tons of wildlife and uh, all sorts of things along with our irrigation. And so this is the two main points I want to come across with is the pillar of Nevada water law is the prior appropriation doctrine, which is senior water rights. And by protecting that, just like the gentleman said before me, then we also protect the environmental issues that are also going to become predominant. And this, none of this is going to go back on the Diamond Valley GMP. This is all for future basins. And I love ranching in Nevada, and I love wildlife in Nevada. And this is something that I think is imperative that we get through to help this in the future. Uh, and my name is Levi Shoda, spelled Levi, L-E-V-I, last name Shoda, S-H-O-D-A. And Mr. Shoda, if you could sit tight for one minute, I believe Senator Hansen had a question for you. Thank you. Are you the one to send the letter? Uh, we are part of it. Yeah, there's a group of us. That okay, well, no, the, question, the reason I'm asking is that uh, um, the springs that have gone, are they literally completely dry as we speak or what? Yes. So we, uh, we have a mitigation right that we have accessed the water, but now we're having to pump the water that used to flow through the springs freely. Um, but Senator Goykachia made a good point early on. Uh, he's very familiar with the basin also. Um, we are just one ranch on the north end that all the springs have dried up. There's many springs on the north end of that basin that have completely dried up from the over-appropriation of it. Well, that's why I'm asking is that you know, how long have you been on the ranch? And just how long ago did this occur is what I'm getting at. Just in the last oh, it's been going on for the springs have started drying up in the 80s. And so, so within the last 40 years, when the see my my, my father-in-law is DA of Eureka County, so I, in fact I spent a lot of time in Diamond Valley trapping golfers, believe it or not, okay. <laughs> on those pivots. But at, at that time, uh, the issue it was starting because at that point everybody's got pivots and they're pumping the water. So I'm just kind of curious of the time frame. So really, in the last 40 years, when the it, when they really significantly started reducing. It started pumping more than the, the base could re, re, uh, replenish is also when the springs died. What I'm looking at is, are they tied together? Okay. Yeah. And there may be other factors that may be making your springs go dry, but it sounds like there's a clear correlation between the, the drying up of the springs and the pumping of the water in the valley. Oh, uh, yes. Levi showed it. Uh, correct. So that was all litigated on and agreed upon by the state engineer. And so that's, and that's really, that's a whole nother issue when you get back to this legislation, you know, that, that was specific to the Diamond Valley situation. We're talking, uh, there's over half the basins in this state that are, I think it's, and I could be wrong, but I think it's 90% of, uh, or you have to be appropriated up to 90% of your perennial yield to be able to be submitted into a critical management area. Well, that, that covers half the basins in the state of Nevada. So to think that this is not going to continue forward it would be nonsense because we just continue to pump and continue to pump. Um, and there's a lot on both sides of this, you know, that people have to lose. So. Well, I got it, but I'm just trying to figure out that, that. I'm just trying to make a correlation in my own mind. The springs, I want to make sure there's a clear correlation. It sounds like when the state engineer comes up, we can double check. Thank you for your letter. We, and we love uh, you guys in those big, beautiful ranches too, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else here in Carson City in support? All right, I don't see anyone in Vegas. Anyone on the phone lines, BPS? If you would like to testify in support of SB 113, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Hello, this is Herman Lewis up in Pahrump, and uh, my comments are specifically toward Basin 162. And this is directed to Senator Pete Go Gokachia, who I had the tremendous pleasure of meeting many times, the Bob Rudd Center. And I think uh, when I came here 10 years ago, the first thing I had to do was learn about water, which I did, and we're now permit holders. We're about to be certificated farming, a small property, a domestic homestead, and I've really done my best to attend all the water district governing board meetings and participate with the county commissioners. And I've gotten to know Senator Gokachi a little bit, um, not in person a lot, but following him. And I've come to the analysis, the overallocation in Basin 162 is simply because there's so many permits issued that never have to be proven up for beneficial use like a small farmer like I would. And I think that if we take a look at that, while I am totally in support of a critical management plan, 
uh, designed by our wonderful uh, groundwater management board, uh, a, a water district governing board, rather. Um, I think that we have to really look at what the bait and switch can be if it's not properly handled. And for Senator Gokachia, I remember you told me, don't worry about your domestic wells. And again, I have water rights now. But the state engineer has no control over domestic wells. And I said, I think you're wrong. I think the state engineer has control over all wells and the waters of Nevada. And you said, nope, they can't do it. And fr this was in front of hundreds of people at the Bob Rudd Center. And then we got to save the domestic well water. To save your water, we're going to have to take 75 percent. And we got AB 95. So if enacted, it would be meters and a 75 percent haircut from two acre feet down to a half an acre feet. Isn't this bill directed towards saving the senior water rights at the expense of the domestic wells? That's my question for Senator Gochia. But I am in support of this to get a critical management plan. Senator, could you help me with this? Um, sir, thank you for your public comment. Actually, this, or excuse me, thank you for your comment and support. Um, questions do tend to come from the committee on this, but if you'd like to reach out to Senator Gokuchi, I, I'm certain that he would be more than happy to get back to you um, outside of this hearing. Okay, that's great, and, I, and I'm going to be happy to do that. So I just want the people to know that to protect senior water rights, and we have water rights, I think it's important, but we have to keep in mind that if you have about 11 Sir, thank you so much. Well, your two minutes was already and, up. And, and they decide they're not We happy. really appreciate your testimony and support, sir. But if you'd like to submit any comments, we'll make sure that any additional comments 100% go on the record. And I know that Senator Goakachia would be happy to get back to you with any questions. Um, however, to make sure that we have time for everyone's comments, um, is there anyone else, BPS, who's calling in support? Chair, you have no more callers in support at this time. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear testimony in opposition to SB 113. Is there anyone in Carson City who'd like to testify in opposition? Seeing no one running to the front here or in the Grant Sawyer building, BPS, is there anyone on the phone lines wishing to provide testimony in opposition to Senate Bill 113? If you would like to testify in opposition of SB 113, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Berg, B-U-R-G. As the chair of the Private Well Owners Association in Nye County, I wish to inform you that we in Nye County vigorously oppose Senate Bill 113. This proposed legislation only requires holders of permits and certificates to have a say in the management of our water. This provides few owners of water rights of having exclusive control of our water management in our area. This bill actually excludes, as in Basin 162, Pahrump, Nevada, any position representing the over 11,500 private domestic well owners. If you consider a two-person well household on a private well, that's over 23,000 persons, not in count the hundreds of homes with two or more per household that are on private well water district systems. Excluding the thousands from the input of this drinking water plant is just plain wrong. This bill threatens our sustainability of the rural lifestyle. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. BPS, is there anyone additional on the phones who'd like to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 113? Chair, you have no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone in Carson City who would like to testify in neutral on this bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. Jake Tibbetts for the record. Um, as the Senator Gokachia mentioned, I did facilitate the process in the Diamond Valley Groundwater Management Plan. Happy to answer any questions that the committee has. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Eureka County. Eureka County is neutral on the bill as drafted and commit ourselves to work on some of the amendments moving forward. Um, 
this a, a thing I'd just like to clarify in the neutral position though is that the Diamond Valley Groundwater Management Plan is not a 35 year plan. The, the goal of the Diamond Valley Plan is to stabilize the groundwater levels. That's the goal. The plan is written to be a 35 year plan and there's, there's, it can be that, but it's all based on water monitoring and the response of the aquifer. So if you were to look at the plan, the first 10 years of the plan have set reductions that require after year 10, that, that first 10 years that it's 30% reduction in pumping has taken place over those first 10 years. That's over halfway. Uh, there needs to be a 55% reduction in pumping total in Diamond Valley to meet the, perennial, the current perennial yield line. So 30% of that 55% would be within the first 10 years. After year 10, the state engineer holds the discretion to either ramp up reductions in pumping or slow them down. And it's all based on the groundwater level response. So it's based on that. So it could go 35 years. That's what's called the benchmark reductions. But I just felt that that was needed to be clarified because it doesn't guarantee that it's a 35 year plan. It could be as short as a 20, 20 year plan. And most of those reductions are in the first 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Did anyone on the committee have any? Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else here in Carson City to testify in neutral? Good afternoon, uh, Chair Pazina, members of the committee, Adam Sullivan, state engineer. I, I'm testifying here in neutral, um, but also testifying because it, it directly the bill directly um, involves actions of the state engineer, so I would just like to offer some perspective. I, I do agree that revisiting the, the critical management area statutes is, is worthwhile um, for the reasons that have already been discussed at, at length here. Um, my comments um, in part are, are fall, fall into the previous discussion of, of wordsmithing um, or, or in answer to some of the previous discussion or make myself available for questions. I would say that the bill a, as it's written is something that our office could feasibly do, um, both for, for future critical management areas um, or for the small portion of this one that applies to Diamond Valley. I, I wanna offer a little bit of perspective on distinguishing between senior and junior rights and the reliance here in this bill on the perennial yield uh, to establish the responsibilities and options uh, regarding a GMP that would be, be developed for a critical management area. So the intent clearly is, is as discussed, is, is to protect the senior rights. And I think there's a common um, understanding or, or pr presumption that the perennial yield is is a, is a line that would that would delineate senior from junior. If your senior, if your priority date is senior to that perennial yield, then you would be exempt from a strict curtailment by priority scenario. And if you were junior to that line, then you would be subject to being curtailed. And th the point that I would just want to make is that that could be accurate or approximate what would actually happen. But there's a lot of situations where that. It, it just wouldn't really work out that way. Um, it, for instance, it, w one of the things that's, that's come up is, is if we enacted a GMP um, today based on the perennial yield estimate that we have, um, if let, let's say there was an adjudication of, of claims to vested rights. So the two minutes is up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going No worries. It was a lot of good information, but I know we had some questions for you as well, so you're not able to leave the hot seat quite yet. Okay. <laughs> Senator Hansen. We'll have to revisit that policy, frankly, because two minutes for an expert like you, the state engineer on a bill like this, so we'll just have to, so, but, but by giving you some questions, we can give you an opportunity to extend beyond two minutes. So uh, several questions. I'd like to have you finish what you're talking about, because it's a very important point of, okay, in my mind, once you get to perennial yield, anything that goes below that, that's a junior water right holder. You're saying that's not the case um, for defining what a senior versus junior water right holder is? Adam Sullivan, for the record, I think that's a convenient way to start the conversation, to get a, con get a sense of what is the capacity of a groundwater basin to support a long-term groundwater pumping. That's a good start. Um, but perennial yield can change 
as we get better science and we understand what the water budget is, that number can change. It, uh, in, um, it, it could look differently depending on how we're, we are accounting for springs, groundwater discharge from springs on the valley floor. Um, the, and then again, who's above or below that line can also change because if we, if we adjudicate cl um, claims to pre-statutory vested rights, that could add more to the array of valid rights in the basin and that would, that would shift that, that spectrum. Well, that, that's why I've always felt sorry for the state water. I know you've heard me say it a million times. Jason King and all you guys, I was like, you, got, you should get a million dollars a year and combat pay for what you have to deal with. <laughs> I'm not totally exaggerating either because you get beat up no matter what you do. Uh, last question, though, real quick, and that is um, in, in the Diamond Valley critical management area, do you have a, I mean, what, you know, like are the, are the springs ultimately at the Saddler Ranch supposed to start flowing again before you say, okay, we reached the correct correct point or are you simply looking for a stabilization at 200 feet on average in your test wells I mean kind of wondering what you know because obviously if we went back and got rid of about everybody we could no doubt get Saddler uh, Springs flowing again but in the meantime you have to shut down how many people in the entire Diamond Valley area so I'm just wondering what what what's your criteria in a I don't know if it's maybe a lot more complicated than a simple answer but you see where I'm going with that one yeah Adam Sullivan, for the record, in part, I can answer that question. So the, the Diamond Valley Groundwater Management Plan was developed by the local community, um, and perhaps Mr. Tibbetts could add to this if necessary, but the objective uh, of, of what success would look like for the GMP is to stabilize the um, groundwater level decline. So you got to set, I mean, 200 feet or, I mean, just, just, just once, wherever you are when you started, as long as it gets to that point and stays at that point, then you're going to say, okay, we're, we're, we at least drop, we're, we're no longer seeing the decline that we've been watching for years, so we've reached stabilization. Ideally, you'd want to see it climb back up to a certain extent, I would hope, but it, your goal is just to stop the bleeding, I guess, would be the way to put it. That's a fair representation. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Senator Flores, did you have a question? Yes, and uh, admittingly, this is my first time sitting uh, on this committee, um, so uh, please correct me at any point in my question where I'm wrong. Um, in, in understanding the issue, uh, my understanding, it was over-appropriated for about 40 years, um, particularly with this uh, uh, scenario that we're talking about. And I know you've mentioned uh, perennial yield, and, and I'm trying to understand, and curtailment, and, and I've researched it, I slightly understand it. Uh, at what point are we setting that? Are we setting that number? Who's setting that number? And the reason I'm trying to understand that is moving forward, um, you know, we're talking about this doctrine of prior appropriations, and I'm trying to understand, because once you, you define that and help me understand that, I, I can understand when we discuss the doctrine of prior appropriations, wh where else in the NRS do we deviate from that doctrine? And do we move away from this concept of saying there's a senior, and the senior will always supersede X, Y, Z? Um, so I want to know if, if that exists, but before we even get into that conversation, I want to understand when we're defining perennial yield, because we had a over-appropriated area for 40 years. How did, how did that happen? Why did that continuously happen? Because I'm trying to understand when are we going to be engaged in this conversation again in a few years and utilizing this language uh, so we could start there, and again, I, you're, put, you're putting me through what, Water 101, and I, and I apologize for doing that to you, but I think it will be very helpful to me to really walk through that methodically, and then I can get to my final question, if that's okay with you, Madam Chair. Adam Sullivan, for the record, there's a lot to that question, <laughs> <laughs> but I will, I will answer some of it. Um, First of all, Diamond Valley was over-appropriated in 1961. 
so it's it's even longer. More than four years. Yeah, um, and the perennial yield is a number. It's a it, it's a number that's set or it's a tool that's used by the state engineer's office. It's not something that was ever in statute until this critical management area um, allowance was created. That's the first time that perennial yield was actually stated in in law, and there's and there's really only one other um, use of it. Um, so. There's a lot of basins where the commitments exceed the perennial yield. The reasons why that's happened are varied and complicated. Um, and Nevada water law is not very well developed or specific about how to manage those outside of curtailment by priority. Um, so the critical management area allowance was, it was the first um, um, statute that, that was interpreted at least by the Supreme Court to allow some deviation from that, that, that concept of prior appropriation. But um, how, how prior appropriation doctrine is applied to reducing groundwater pumping where that is, um, that, that where that's necessary is, is not something that is very well developed in water law. Uh, and I appreciate it. Uh, um, I have a right then to not be 100% sure where I'm at with it uh, because you've made it abundantly clear that I shouldn't be there. <laughs> the NRS is not exactly um, defined, uh, de helping us define everything as it should. Um, so if, if I could just have you reiterate that last portion uh, in discussing the doctrine of prior appropriation and really what the heart of, of this conversation is about. If you could just clarify that one more time, that we don't have that now in the NRS, that there is another section where if X, Y, Z happens, that doctrine of prior appropriation that we so often reference and so much case law has been developed around, that that goes away. Um, because obviously in this case law, that in, this, in this Supreme Court case from 2022, um, they specifically, you know, the argument fell upon on whether or not the, the legislative intent was to deviate from that doctrine. And what I'm trying to understand is in what other scenarios have we engaged as a legislative body and said uh, we also need to deviate from that? And if, 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 if you know of that, it, because again, I, I foresee that at some point we're going to be engaging in this conversation again down the road, and I'm just trying to understand if we as a legislative body have ever done that. Adam Sullivan, for the record, I, I'm not entirely aware of what's been dis discussed in, in the past. Um, I, I would say that even with the Diamond Valley Plan, prior appropriation doesn't go away. Just the way that it was handled was... Um, was different than a strict curtailment by priority. But when we talk about prior appropriation doctrine, you know, the simple concept is, is first in time, first in right. If you have a senior priority and you're continuously using that water, then that, then that use is protected from junior users. Um, and, um, so as long as it's being beneficially used, it's in good standing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and again, uh, a lot of that was just you educating me, so I, I appreciate you walking me through it and, and massaging the conversation for me. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I'm happy you had the extra time to finish up with some of those answers because there was a lot of great information we needed from you as the state engineer that two minutes could not fulfill. So thank you. Um, I'm also well aware that our bill sponsor needs to be leaving in the next 10 minutes for another meeting. So um, be aware of that, those commenting in neutral. Um, <laughs> continue up for those that are commenting in neutral here in Carson City. Okay. <laughs> uh, Chair Pizzina and uh, members of the committee who are left, I guess, uh, Senator Flores. Uh, for the record, I'm Jeff Fontaine, spelled F-O-N-T-A-I-N-E, and I am the Executive Director of the Central Nevada Regional Water Authority and Humboldt River Basin Water Authority. 
And uh, both CNRWA and HRBWA uh, strongly support the prior appropriation doctrine and uh, are neutral on this bill. Um, there's only one groundwater management plan and only one critical management area in the state, and, and you heard about uh, Diamond Valley. That was a unique situation and a plan that is very specific uh, to Diamond Valley. However, going forward, um, it's very possible that we're going to see uh, additional critical management areas designated, and um, I think it's also very likely that um, many of those critical management areas will be either in the central uh, Nevada region or the Humboldt region or both regions, I should say. So going forward, uh, Senate Bill 113 would, uh, I think, make it more difficult uh, in, critical manage in, area, in critical management areas uh, to develop those groundwater management plans and, and actually be successful in having those uh, um, uh, uh, be successful in, in the 10-year time frame. Um, we all know what the, um, the, uh, the impacts are and their significant impacts of mandatory curtailment on uh, junior water right holders as well as um, the larger communities. And so uh, we want to make sure that um, going forward that uh, with Senate Bill 113 and requiring um, strict adherence to prior appropriation that there will be some consideration about additional tools to help um, provide some um, additional opportunity to develop groundwater management plans that will be successful and also to make the impacts of uh, the ultimate uh, curtailment, if that's necessary, um, less severe. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair. Chauncey Chowdo on behalf of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Um, we are here in neutral on this bill, and, uh, you know, we did propose an amendment. I want you to know that we've worked with the sponsor, worked with the Farm Bureau on it. Um, I know time is of the essence, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but really our real, we support what Senator Gokuchi is trying to do. We believe that it's needed. It's just the execution of it. Really, that's kind of where we're at, and a lot of wordsmithing, too. So the reason why we proposed our amendment was first, like, I don't want to belabor the point, but the issue of perennial yield, the definition of it, the establishment, how do you calculate it, where does it start, those are things we just wanted clarified. And then the other section that um, we, we, we struck was Section 6, um, and that was because, you know, we wanted a little bit more clarification on if you have folks in that previous section who, you know, voted to create a groundwater management plan, but then opted out of it, how effective would that plan would be? So those are kind of the two main provisions uh, that we were just curious about. Again, support what Senator Gokuchi is trying to do. We believe that it's needed. Just had some questions. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else in Carson City here to testify neutral? We're down to what, six minutes, Senator? All right. I don't see anyone coming up in Vegas. BPS, is there anyone on the phone lines testifying in neutral? Chair, your line is open and working, but you have no callers at this time. Well, look at that timing. We have five minutes to close this out. Senator Gokachia, would you like to provide any closing remarks? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Gokachia, for the record, just a couple of things. <clears throat> Uh, one of them to uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Flores. Uh, you know, you have to understand at the point you declare an area, a 10-year critical management area, and then if you don't come with a groundwater plan, then the statute requires that you do curtail by priority. And so then wherever that perennial yield line is or wherever you determine it to be, those people below that, or you start cutting until you get up there and bring the balance, and it's harsh. And I guess that's why we really look at trying to do a groundwater plan, let the, those people that are going to be impacted in that basin try and work it out, which is what they tried to do in Diamond Valley. It's just, and hopefully they'll still get there. The numbers will reflect it. But, and to Senator Hansen's point, ultimately, though, what is recovery of a basin that's been over pumped for 70 years? It's a problem. And uh, I don't know how we fix it, but water is going to be an issue. We're great this year. We got, we're going to have a, get a little drink, but I'm concerned about where it goes down the road. So with that, ma'am, we'll continue to work with, with some of the people that are, uh, we're wordsmith and we'll beat on it. I think we'll come back with the, some language we can agree on and uh, hopefully we can get it out. Senator Flores. Uh, Madam Chair, I think Senator Hanson and I agree that this bill is perfect. We're ready to move it now. <laughs> 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 All right, I'll be right there to vote. Go ahead. <laughs> 
And now I'm starting. Now I'm trying to start a real fight. <laughs> I'm kidding, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. With that, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 113. And I'm going to geek out a little bit because we're about to receive a presentation from the Desert Research Institute. I had the opportunity to come visit with them in their Las Vegas office not so long ago and was fascinated with the wonderful work they're doing and would love to have them come forward, press the mic button and identify themselves for the record and proceed with their presentation when ready. Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, I am uh, Kamut Acharya, President of the Desert Research Institute. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Justin uh, Huntington. I'm gonna take the first half of the presentation and I'm gonna pass it on to him, second half. I'm pleased to uh, share some of the work that uh, DRI scientists are doing to create a better future for Nevadans. So who we are, uh, for those of you not very familiar with DRI, uh, we are one of uh, Nevada System of Higher Education institutions, one of eight. Uh, we have two campuses, uh, one in Las Vegas and one in Reno. Uh, we started here in Reno uh, more than 60 years ago. We have more than 450 scientists, engineers, uh, students and support staff, and more than 100 PhD uh, faculty working on 40 different disciplines. One unique difference between DRI and remaining seven institutions, we do not um, grant degrees at DRI. We only conduct research. We do have students working from other institutions at DRI. We support them financially. We work with, our, they work with our students. And also DRI faculty are not funded by the state. Their salaries do not come from the state. They bring their own salaries. Uh, with that, last year, DRI generated $43 million in grants and contracts. This is all the money that came to Nevada from outside of the state. Uh, in addition to external grants and contracts, we do get state support, about approximately about 15, 16% of our budget that covers our administration and facilities. So with that, uh, the economic impact and return on investment for the state is every dollar the state gives us or invests in DRI we bring in additional $4.95 to the state. So what we do, DRI science, the scientists at DRI, most of our science can be broadly grouped under three topics, atmospheric sciences, hydrologic sciences, and earth and ecosystem sciences. Uh, please allow me to share a few examples within that, a uh, few, few research uh, that is currently happening at DRI, microplastics. The, the, the picture that you see here is Dr. Monica Arienzo. Fortunately, she's actually in the audience here today. She was meeting with one of the senators. So she is leading a group that is studying microplastics. What is microplastics? Microplastics are small plastic fragments. They can be micrometer in size or a few millimeters in size. They can come from degraded, plas larger plastic uh, materials, or they can come from your fabrics, or they can come from cosmetics. Now the microplastics are being discovered in pristine lakes such as Lake Tahoe, Lake Mead, Alps, all over the place. And uh, Dr. Arianjo and her team are trying to find out, identify, investigate the sources of those microplastics and if they, can, they, they can come up with the solutions to treat or at the source of those microplastics. This is, a, this is becoming an emerging uh, contaminant of concern for the whole country or the world. Um, Cloud seeding. Um, unfortunately, Senator Pete Goikuchia left because he is uh, intimately familiar with our cloud seeding program. DRI's cloud seeding program, DRI actually is a pioneer in the practice of cloud seeding. It's been DRI's, uh, we used to manage a statewide cloud seeding campaign for years, and then the, there were some funding issues, and right now we still have, uh, I believe, 27 generators spread all over Nevada and a few other states. Basically, what cloud seeding is, we seed clouds during the storms to increase precipitation by 10 to 12 percent. And this is a much needed at times of uh, droughts, you know. Also, DRI houses one of the six regional climate centers in the country. The Western Regional Climate Center is housed at DRI since the 80s. 
The center's job is to collect uh, climate data for 11 Western United States states and analyze those data and provide that to any public, local authorities or federal or state agencies. Basically use that for their policy, uh, uh, for making policies or other, make the other decisions related to climate change. So uh, one of the products that comes out of Climate Center is like, you can see this map, you may have seen it. This is a US drought monitor. This map is produced every week, I believe, and then one of our faculty works with other agencies, USDA, Environmental Defense Fund, to produce this map, and that basically tells you which part of the country is drought-stricken and what management actions need to be taken. You know, climate, is, climate change is having a heavy impact in the Western US. Las Vegas is one of the fastest warming cities in the country. The built environment, pavement roads are creating urban heat islands, those microclimate within the city, and that's happening. And so DRI scientists are working to understand ways to make communities more resilient, including understanding ways to cool urban areas. Among many things uh, related to climate change, uh, this is one of the topics that, are, that is very important and urgent. Also, living with wildfires, DRI scientists are deeply involved in a number of different topics within wildfires. wildfires. Right now, there is a $20 million National Science Foundation grant, DRI is leading, uh, with UNLV and UNR, looking at a number of different topics, looking at uh, the um, impact of wildfires on soil dynamics. Once the fire burns that area, the soil becomes very impermeable, and then the chances of de uh, debris flow and mudslide increases. We're also looking at the impact of wildfire smoke on public population health. And then our scientists are also developing a wildfire forecast model. Uh, once the fire starts, where is that fire going to go based on meteorological conditions? DRI also houses one of those. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, one of the climate control facilities in our Reno campus. This facility is basically supports our local agriculture producers on innovative ways to produce Ags, different uh, products. How do we? How do you minimize water uses and maximize uh, efficiency? Uh, Chair President, I would invite you to come to our Reno campus one day, and I'll show you around there because you've been to our Las Vegas campus. And then, so this facility basically uh, helps our local farmers with the innov innovative farming practices. And then, uh, this is our Reno campus and the solar field. 50% uh, of our energy in both of our campuses comes from solar. Las Vegas and Reno both. And we're also with that, we're also in, involved in research on maximizing efficiency of solar energy. Uh, DRI also has a quite a few group of uh, archaeologists. Uh, you know, uh, since 1969, DRI research, uh, DRI anthropologists and archaeologists have worked to understand how culture and environmental conditions impact people's decisions. DRI anthropologists study modern people while archaeologists study the materials left by past people. Beginning in 2016, we've also uh, started to offer service in archaeological history. It's an important area of research within DRI. And also, uh, this is a new topic at DRI. Dr. Arienzo and her colleagues are also looking at well water contamination in Nevada. Uh, they recently did a study, looked at um, study. They found that more than 50,000 private wells in Nevada and parts of the Great Basin may be at risk for elevated uh, arsenic in well water. They sampled 174 uh, wells and found 22% actually exceeded EPA guidelines on arsenic here. I wish all of our water people hadn't left. <laughs> so DRI also works very closely uh, with uh, DOE on Nevada National Security Site. We provide all kinds of services to them, engineering, hydrologic, and science support. We also monitor radionuclides in groundwater system within Nevada and support them. This is a long established relationship. And we also work very closely with uh, Department of Defense. We work with the US Army and Navy uh, with the uh, we, uh, environmental characteristics such as dust, cold, and other environmental factors can impact how military equipment responds. So DRI actually supports US military in making sure that their equipment works in all environments. With that, I would like to invite Dr. Justin Huntington to talk a little bit more about his research. That is the reason why we're here. Thank you. Thanks, Kamud. And thanks, Madam Chair, 
Pazina for the invite. Uh, it's really a pleasure to talk with the committee uh, about some of our work. Um, so my name for the record is uh, Justin Huntington, J-U-S-T-I-N-H-U-N-T-I-N-G-T-O-N. I'm a research professor of hydrology at the Desert Research Institute, mostly focused on uh, consumptive water use mapping and uh, groundwater, perennial yield estimation, and remote sensing of, of consumptive water use. So uh, also work uh, a lot with, with drought and uh, measurement of evaporation off of reservoirs. And so this is a picture of our, what we call an eddy covariance uh, weather station that we have on Lake Powell to better understand evaporation rates off of Lake Powell and also Lake Mead. You've probably heard in the news about uh, the importance of evaporation estimates uh, from uh, these reservoirs uh, with respect to Colorado River water rights. So, it's really important that we get a better understanding of evaporation rates. Uh, it's one of the least known uh, fluxes, uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, from, from uh, these systems on the Colorado River is, is, is uh, open water evaporation. So with respect to uh, evaporation uh, and also transpiration, or what we call evapotranspiration, combining those, or ET, um, Water applied to uh, agricultural field ultimately gets consumed uh, through evaporation from bare soil, transpiration from plants. Uh, that water that gets applied can also recharge the underlying groundwater uh, and also run off and return to the system. But the large majority of what gets consumed uh, is through the process of evapotranspiration. And so we use satellite imagery to actually track the evapotranspiration. Uh, we can't put those stations out that you just saw uh, everywhere to, to measure and monitor evapotranspiration. So in order for us to really scale, uh, both through time and space, we have to use satellites. And so that's why we developed this program called Open ET or Open Evapotranspiration, where we use satellites, we use spatially gridded weather data. Uh, we bring those things together with uh, some models, and we ultimately produce maps of evapotranspiration at 30 meter pixel resolution for the whole western U.S. Uh, and for context, that's about a quarter acre, the infield of a baseball diamond. And so we've made an application where you can actually zoom in to any uh, agricultural field in the west and, and go on click and be able to click and get the monthly evapotranspiration rates for any field. And so we've, we've hand digitized all the agricultural fields in the state of Nevada. Uh, and then we've also ingested uh, agricultural field GIS or geographic information system field boundaries from the other Western states and mapped our ET rates or the, 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 the RAST or the image data. We've mapped those to the polygons to then get spatial summaries and build a big geo database, what we call. And so this is Diamond Valley, and you can go on click and click a field in Diamond Valley, and you can see the reduction in water use uh, by implementing this groundwater management plan. And just to interrupt briefly, I am beyond fascinated by this. We talked about this at the Las Vegas field office, and that is indeed why DRI is coming in to present today, because I am just in awe of this. And knowing where we are trying to save water, what we were just talking about today, I felt like this was such an important presentation. So thank you again and keep going. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> so, so what we can do now um, is, is actually monitor the reduction in consumptive water use. And so this is an example in uh, Grand Valley, Colorado, uh, where they've implemented uh, a pilot program, a system conservation pilot program, where they voluntarily didn't irrigate for a year. And you could probably imagine what year that is by looking at this chart. Um, it's the second year or the second little hump here. You can see that little hump and then uh, the flat line in the second year. That was basically the spring rain that got consumed by the plants uh, and then they didn't irrigate for the rest of the year. Then they did a partial irrigation in that third year. You can see the, the, the shape of that curve is, is very narrow. Uh, so they irrigated and then they, and then they shut it down. Um, so that was a partial irrigation. And then they went back to full irrigations, and you can see the, the shapes of those curves got much uh, broader. So we can actually quantify what we call the conserved consumptive use. And we've heard a lot about that discussion in the, in the Colorado River Basin right now on how conserved consumptive use is actually what's going to save the Colorado River. 
<clears throat> so here is just a cumulative plot of those monthly time series where you can see that the year uh, of the voluntary uh, program, that's that bottom curve there, used very little water, uh, and then the partial year more, and then back to full. And we can actually print those values out in the, in the, in the user interface in acre feet. So the Nevada Water Initiative, um, we received uh, some ARPA funds, both USGS, the State Engineer's Office, as well as DRI, uh, to basically start uh, the Nevada Water Initiative. And the DRI project activities were basically providing data and guidance for systematic sy statewide updates for agricultural consumptive water use inventories. We're building a consumptive water use database for the whole state based on OpenET. Um, we're also uh, updating the science and estimates of groundwater discharge rates throughout the state. And groundwater discharge is often used to determine or estimate perennial yield. Uh, groundwater discharge is, is a, a, a really important and uh, probably the best way to estimate perennial yield. Uh, in a natural system, you have groundwater recharge coming in, and that groundwater recharge naturally discharges through plants that we call phreatophytes, or plants that tap the shallow groundwater table. And when we start to pump, we lower the water table and we capture that natural groundwater discharge. By definition, it's conservation of mass. We gotta capture that water from somewhere. So we're salvaging water from phreatophytes and putting that water to beneficial use. So that's how that works. And so groundwater discharge is really the basis of perennial yield. And so we're updating the science to better understand perennial yield estimates throughout the state. My uh, meteorological and hydrologic monitoring, um, uh, I'll talk about that. And then uh, we're also uh, working towards uh, uh, better understanding and estimating groundwater recharge and water availability. But it's easier to estimate the discharge than the recharge because we can see the discharge. We can measure it. We can put stations out. Okay, so consumptive water use database. We're going back through time uh, into the late 70s using the Landsat archive. Landsat is a, is a satellite mission operated by the USGS. It takes uh, pictures of Earth every eight to 16 days. Um, I call them Earth selfies. Uh, it's the longest continuous record of Earth observations that we have. Um, we're updating field boundaries through time. We're mapping irrigation status. So for every polygon, we can say, irrigated, not irrigated, or shorted, all the way back to the 70s, so that we know what fields to sum up volumes for. <clears throat> We're uh, identifying irrigation system type, whether it's flood, furrow, center pivot, wheel line, uh, and then we're also uh, uh, merging all these data with the water rights database, whether it's surface water, groundwater, or commingled, um, and then ultimately we're calculating net ET, or what we call consumptive water use. The meteorological data and monitoring, so we have a network of 18 agricultural weather stations to better understand agricultural water requirements and also to support growers in terms of irrigation scheduling, supporting on-farm conservation, and then water use reporting efforts, and then supporting new efforts like what's shown here in the center picture in Diamond Valley, that's called LEPA, Low Energy Precision Application, where they're converting their center pivot systems uh, by just doubling down on, uh, doubling up on the downspouts and dragging the nozzles in the alfalfa to basically conserve what we call the non-beneficial avoidable consumptive use, i.e. the rainbows. Um, we, and they're saving 20% right out of the gate by converting to this new technology so it's really low hanging fruit and there's a lot of potential to conserve a lot of water and so we're helping folks implement this technology and with that i'll i'll uh, take any questions thank you thank you so much doctors i mean this is just so fascinating to me i'm disappointed that our vice chair had to leave to give a presentation and that our one of our other members was um, joining another committee because I, I think this is so interesting and I'm so happy we had some of our committee here to see this today, um, as well as our state engineer and SNWA and some other people here in the room to watch. But I'd love to ask if the committee has any questions. <laughs> Senator Hansen. Well, I'm like you, I find that fa absolutely fascinating. Just even the pivots out in Diamond Valley, just doing, instead of the traditional, 
spray method that everybody still uses, you guys come up with a plan to basically drop the water on the ground instead of losing it through. Now, the word evapotranspiration, I'd never heard it defined. So what you're saying is you combine regular evaporation, but then the amount of water that goes through the plant, and that's where the word comes from, right? Okay, well, I learned something there, too. The other thing, the 1970s, you can go clear back to the 1970s, and you can chart the water use literally every 16 days going back, and it's accurate. I mean, you know, the, 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 the technology is, you know, 1970 to me isn't that far, uh, <laughs> but for some of the people here, they weren't born at that window of time. So uh, how accurate is the older data? And because uh, I'd love to see some of that part too, just watching the changes over time on the, on the consumption of water and the amount being supplied to the state. Madam Chair, through you. Uh, you can go direct and thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Justin Huntington. Uh, so the earlier images uh, are not, uh, the, the, the spectral wavelengths, if you will, are not the same exactly as the, the, the satellites that we launched in the mid 80s. And so we have to make some corrections, but, but typically the, the uncertainty uh, and, the, and the accuracy of monthly evapotranspiration that we're estimating is within 10 to 15%. That's, that's the inner comparisons and the validation that we've done over the fat, past few years is it showing it's within 10 to 15 percent but the earlier imagery a little bit more than that I would say well still it's over 40 years worth you guys have so I, I got to get in touch with you I want to go over a couple of bases. Yeah. <laughs> actually when Adam was up here talking he mentioned a great deal about the new science and figuring out perennial yield you're the man he's talking about then correct one of them uh, yeah. USGS Wait. and and DRI I would say are, are the experts in the state yes Good. So what, now who backs up you? Okay, you said USGS. So we also have a federal Dr. Huntington type that we do to make sure your numbers are, you know, who, who's your check, I guess, you, I would say. We work a lot together. Uh, Phil Gardner at, at the US Geological Survey, he's the groundwater specialist for the Nevada Water Science Center. Good. So when Adam shows up here and starts talking about the experts are checking out the perennial yield and these basins and we've readjusted our numbers, you and the guy, whatever his name was from USGS, is who he's talking about then, huh? That's correct. Ah, good to place a face with a name. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Flores. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for the presentation. Very fascinating. Uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot. Uh, I'm just curious to know uh, what, what type of relationship we have with high schools. I know uh, I, I see here that you're in Las Vegas and Reno and you're in eight uh, – Enchi institutions, um, and one of the things that we're often talking about in other uh, committees, but I think it's relevant for this conversation today, is how are we getting our younger folk excited about this, making the you know the next doctor and getting them kind of a pathway. Often, I think what happens with kids is they never they, they never even know that this exists, right? And then somebody tells them you're capable of engaging in this world. So I'm just curious to know if you're engaging younger folk outside of the college world. Thank you, Senator Flores. Uh, Kamut Acharya, uh, DRI president for the record. DRI, I did not have time to include all of that. Uh, I would love to have you over at DRI and walk you through some of our K-12 programs at DRI. We do have a very robust K-12 STEM outreach program at DRI. We have so-called, I think we shared with you, uh, Chair Prezina, we have those uh, green boxes. I'm not, I'm not sure you've heard of DRI's green boxes. DRI's green boxes, green suitcases, are each suitcase is, is a mini lab in itself. We have 150 of those uh, boxes designed for different scientific topics. We actually uh, share those boxes with school teachers all over Nevada, actually free of cost. They can go, out, go to our website and request those boxes. Uh, to us, and we ship them for free. We also send that. We also ship them back to DRI at our cost. Those boxes are designed to teach small children different science topics. These are all mini science topics, and so we are actively involved. We've reached over 100,000 school kids on different science topics in Nevada already. I'd love to share more details about those programs. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I'll. I'll I'll just add, uh, Justin Huntington, for the record, um, we also just launched a, an internship program uh, where you can uh, uh, basically, uh, where folks can shadow, high school students can shadow uh, research professors. And um, I actually have four 
high school students working directly under me. Thank you. And one other, again, we didn't have time to do the entire presentation today with time constraints, but one of the things you shared with me, and, and I would love to hear more detail about it now, was a project one of your scientists was working on. I think the committee would be interested in Greenland with a tube of ice. And I, that's all I'll say because you can really share the details, but this blew my mind. Thank you, Chair. Kamura uh, Acharya, for the record. Yes, we do have a one of the, um, I'd say, arguably one of the best ice core programs at DRI in the country. Uh, our ice core team led by uh, uh, Professor Joe McConnell, his team was in Greenland last summer for six weeks collecting ice core samples. They brought those ice core samples, they are currently analyzing those samples, uh, and they are basically looking at the last 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years of climate history. And one of the things they shared with me at the time was looking at the sociological history along with the ice samples and, and maybe what led to declines of empires and, and how they could determine that through drought and other factors by looking at those ice samples. Again, fascinating stuff for another time, I'm sure. Hopefully we can plan a committee field trip maybe um, later on. Senator Hansen? Oh, we can't leave that one. The, uh, there's a big Russian word about the ice core samples, Vlastostok or something like that. Are you guys familiar with those two? I mean, it's very similar to what you're doing, but they've already been doing that. And uh, ice core samples that were done somewhere, I don't know where exactly. We'll talk offline. I don't want to get off in the weeds. What is the name of it? Thank you. Yeah, so you're familiar with it then. Okay. She, well, she was part of the ice core team back in the day. Ah, good. Well, I'd love to talk to her afterwards. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you so much for your presentations, doctors. I think it was very well received. Um, at this point, our final business is going to be public comment. As a reminder for public comment, it, it should not have anything to do with the bills that were discussed here today. Um, at this point, we'd like to say two minutes per person, but please feel free to submit additional written comments to the secretary and they will be added to the record. Is there any public comment here in Carson City? All right, seeing none here and not seeing anyone in Las Vegas, BPS, is there anyone wishing to provide public comment on the phone lines? Chair, your public line is open and working, but you have no callers at this time. All right, seeing no further public comment, this concludes our meeting. The meeting is adjourned.